What is it that you can use in your past to help you succeed in your business right now? Hey, what's up? It's Aaron, and welcome back to the Cash PT Lunch Hour podcast. Um, today, I'm the guest and the host. Uh, we're going to do something a little uh, different, or maybe it's the same. You never know. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is about how everything I learned about business, I learned from racing bicycles. Okay, um, maybe you didn't know that I used to race bicycles and I actually had a dream to be a professional cyclist and race in the Tour de France. I mean, I, you know, did I really think I was gonna race in the Tour de France? I couldn't tell you that, but I knew I wanted to win bike races and I knew that Racing a, racing a bike, riding a bike, gave me a feeling that I didn't get from anywhere else. So there's a couple interesting things about this. I've spoken to this about a few people lately, um, especially my brother who wants me to do a 100-mile gravel ride with him next year. Um, you know, and I've grown up racing bikes, and you may not know this about me, um, but bicycle racing got me into my healthcare career. I was telling, I was on a guest on a podcast yesterday, it's like, Aaron, how'd you get into physical therapy? Well, it all started with massage therapy. Well, how'd I get into massage? Well, it all started with me racing bikes. So when I was younger, my brother, um, one of his tutors was a um, you know semi-pro cyclist. He actually went to the Olympic trials, but had injured his knee and didn't really get selected for the Olympic uh, event. Um, but uh, Svi was a big uh, influence on my brother, my brother Dave. He's younger than me. He's about what, 18 months younger than me, maybe 20 months younger than me. Uh, so my brother Dave started racing bikes and we did some rides together and I worked at the bike shop, but I really couldn't let my brother be better at something than me. So I wanted to start racing bikes and I started like end of high school. Um, when I got to college, uh, there was a you know Duke cycling team or a club and uh, I joined and raced bikes with my brother during the summer and did rides with my brother and uh, a bunch of guys that were older than me, 30 years old. I don't know. At that time, I was like, God, you guys are ancient. <laughs> but um, how did it get me into massage therapy? Well, that summer, I'd done a lot of training, a lot of riding, and my legs hurt. And I said to my mom, Mom, my just legs hurt. Every time I go ride, it just doesn't feel good. I was probably overtraining a little bit, but she um, suggested, hey, why don't you, maybe you should get a massage. Why don't we get you a massage? So she got me a massage at a... Uh, uh, with, with someone locally who did sports massage and um, she worked on me and I, my legs never felt better. So that was one of the like big aha moments I had. Like, wow, my body feels so much better now that I had a massage. And then one of my other mentors racing over the next few years was big into getting massage after races. There was always um, generally someone there doing uh, leg massages after races for like five bucks or something like that. And so I'd get a couple. He's like, Aaron, you need to get one. You need to spend your money on this. This is what's uh, going to help you. Um, you know, so that got me into it. So I started racing bicycles, and I moved. I moved to well, let's see. Uh, I, when you go to Duke, uh, you're either going to be a lawyer, a doctor, right? In your quote, to doc physician or a like management consultant. Well, clearly, I wasn't going to get through organic chemistry because I quit the first uh, after the first day because um, I didn't want to do four hours of homework at night. And I didn't know what I wanted to do, um, but I knew I wanted to ride bikes. And so racing bikes was one of the things I wanted to do. So I moved out to California where bike racing in the U.S. was like top notch. And so if you don't know anything about bike racing, when you ride road bikes, we're talking about um, criteriums anywhere from 20 to you know 50 mile criteriums, which are loops of a half a mile to a mile and a half, or road races, uh, which are anywhere from 50 to 150 miles um, as circuit races are more like a, a two to eight mile loop that you do over and over again. Those are the kind of, that's the kind of bicycle racing I did. Not a lot of mountain biking and a little bit of track riding, but uh, California is where you should be. Um, I, I could it take me three hours to go through the whole thing, but I moved out there because I, I spent a summer in Berkeley, loved it. And I was like, I got to go to California get out of here. So I graduated college and went to California and tried to find a job, did a bunch of odd things, ended up becoming a bike messenger. Okay, I couldn't afford to race bikes. I couldn't afford it because you had to pay for your hotel, you had to pay for your entry fee. And I was making like 
10 bucks an hour 20 for 25 hours a week working at a restaurant and it wasn't enough money it was expensive to live out there i could ride but i couldn't really do that and i ended up becoming a bike messenger well because i loved to ride and i made money riding um, bikes but i couldn't race i couldn't push myself i couldn't be competitive like i am competitive i don't know about you um, but i'm fiercely competitive like I will prove you wrong. And that's a big reason why I'm here is because you tell me I can't do something, I'm gonna go out there and prove you wrong because I'm gonna beat you. I don't know where I get that from, but I'm gonna go beat you no matter what it is. I mean, to my limits, right? Like you wanna do a push press competition or a snatch, a red snatch competition with a barbell, like I'm not gonna push myself to try to beat you because I know my limitations there. But I'm gonna choose the movement that I can go as hard as I can. And it wasn't soccer and it wasn't basketball. It wasn't ball sports. It's not overhead uh, Olympic weightlifting. I'm six foot three. <laughs> the barbell's got to go a long way. Um, but riding a bike, man, I can get on there and I can just crush you at it. And I can crush you at business and I can crush you at bikes and I can crush you in endurance. Not a staring contest. Um, you know, I can crush you at a... Uh, ADD contest. <laughs> but anyways, let me get back on track. So, um, but I couldn't race bikes, right? I couldn't race. I could ride. And I knew I wanted to be, I, I, I had gone to college to be a physician, right? I was pre-med. I knew I wanted to work with people. I wanted to work with my hands. I wanted to help people heal. My dad and my uncles, my grandfather, hit, my grandfather's brother were all physicians. They were all healers. I knew that was in there somewhere. And I had an aha moment one day and, you know, my mom had helped me. She was like, you should, you know, maybe you should look into doing a career as a massage therapist. I was like, nah, mom, that's not it. But I I'd, I'd also, one of my yoga classes in college, we got introduced to doing massage and um, like partner massage and relaxation and, and that kind of thing. And, but I did have this aha moment. I had looked into it. I was like, well, you know what? If I become a massage therapist, I can work four hours a day. I can see four patients a day, make 35 to $85 an hour, depending on whether I work for myself or someone else. And I'll have time to race my bikes and I'll have enough money to afford to live in San Francisco and pay for the bike racing. So I went to massage therapy school. It cost me $9,000. It's the best $9,000 I've ever spent. I spent $900 on my massage table. So here's a lesson right away is that I invested in myself $9,000. I knew that I was going to get that money back. And I bought a massage table. It was a $900 massage table. It was like the cream of the crop. It had been to the, it was a night, it was built, hand built for the 1996 Olympics. Um, and then it was refurbished. So I actually got a deal on it. But guess what? That $900 has seen thousands of bodywork, massage and bodywork sessions and PT sessions. And it's still being used in our clinic today. I've put new legs on it and, you know, little rubber feet. Um, it's uh, not in perfect condition, but it's still like the most comfortable, best massage table we have. It's an investment I made. It was a stretch at the time, but it's still here. Had I not made that investment or gone to massage school, I wouldn't be talking to you. So um, when I went to massage school, we did two uh, semesters of school. Each semester, one was a Western modalities, the other was Eastern modalities. Um, if you don't know what Eastern modalities is, more like shiatsu, trigger point therapy. Um, uh, like we learned meridians and mindfulness and that. So in each uh, semester, we did a business class. Guess what? I did not get a business class at Elon's DBT program. Well, we got a, a class in uh, a little bit insurance and a little bit of building out a uh, 5,000 square foot facility for $250,000 loan. That was not a business class. That was a joke. We didn't actually learn how to um, make money as physical therapists. But I, when I in massage school, I learned how to make money as a massage therapist. So that's lesson number one. I invested to learn how to make money to free up my time to do something different. Okay. So, um, but it, let's talk about racing bikes. I could race bikes, right? And so um, if you race bikes, there's categories. It's uh, 54321 Pro. And then there's pro and then there's division three pro division two division one and then there's the guys that go to the tour de france and then there's the guys that win like lance armstrong so if you don't know much about it um you know maybe you played uh college basketball but did you ever play with michael jordan doubt it 
if you're listening and you played with the greatest of all time, Michael Jordan, the GOAT, because LeBron James is not the GOAT, it's Michael, um, let me know. I want to know, do you get on a court with him ever? Um, at Duke, I got pretty good at playing basketball and I never played on the, there was like one court that was like the guys that were like <clears throat> the guys that played on the, the main team and their friends who were good <laughs> or the guys that had played a few years back and they'd come and they'd play. Like you had to be like collegiate level to play on that court, you know, um, because that's where all the guys that graduated would come play. And then there was another court over and I could play on that court. I could hold my own. I couldn't score at will. I couldn't like defend like someone really well, but I could hold my own and be a team player and I could, and I could occasionally get a basket in, but I couldn't get free to shoot a three pointer and make it. No, I wasn't that good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in bicycle racing, I was able to do, I got to the level of racing in pro races in Europe, um, and pro races in the United States. Did I belong in the race? Yeah, I did. Cause I deserved it. Was I competitive? No. I wasn't that good, you know, but I worked my ass to get there. I worked hard to get there. Okay. So some of the things that I've learned is, um, you, you've got to be around people that are better than you and you have to be persistent and success isn't winning. It's consistency. So let me go through some of these things. So like I said, like this is about me cause I know me. I don't know you, but if I can relate these stories to you in a way that would connect you to what is it that you can use in your past to help you succeed in your business right now, because you may just be looking at your business right now as I'm a physical therapist and I need to have a business to get out of the job, but I can't get patients to come in or I'm struggling to make money or, Hey, even though I'm making $8,000 a month for the last three months, I don't feel successful because nothing I'm trying is working. Okay, guess what? I started racing bikes when I was 18. I, um, it took me, uh, when I was in college, I, I was able to go from a category five to a four in a year, and then from a four to a three. And I stayed a category three through college. I um, got out of college and I, I couldn't really race. Uh, for the first year out of college, I spent in Israel because um, you know, I had like a heart arrhythmia in right at my junior year in college. It's a story for another day. So I stopped racing bikes for a couple of years and instead of going to Europe to race bikes, I said, well, I'm going to go to Israel and do a service learning project. I came back and I was healthy and I was like, I want to ride bikes again. And that's when I went to San Francisco. I couldn't race. I was able to ride. I became a messenger. I finally became a massage therapist. So I could start racing bikes again. That took five years. Okay. Then I started racing as category three and I was pretty good, but not great. I wouldn't win everything, but I was really strong and determined and I trained and I trained myself and I went on group rides and I rode with guys that were better than me. I did these weekly um, or bi-weekly uh, kind of training criteriums and the local pro guys would show up. Um, there were guys that, you know, were not as good as me would show up and guys on my team and we pushed each other, right? And then I got to a point where um, I thought I was good enough. I went to um, Belgium and I, I raced over there and I was in over my head racing bikes in Belgium. I went there as a category three. Everyone told me, Aaron, you're not going to, um, don't expect to finish your first race or any races at all. I finished my third race um, there. I actually made some money, which is amazing. Um, and then I didn't finish the next two races. And I had a rule that if I had to finish at least half the race in order to get a hamburger at the hamburger stand. Um, but, uh, but I was in there racing. These guys grow up. It's like baseball in America <laughs> or basketball here. Like over there, bicycle racing is the number one sport. And then there's football or soccer, right? And in Belgium, like Belgium is like bicycle racing heartland. Like these guys are so fast. You're like, that guy doesn't look fast and he just crush you. Um, so I, I spent uh, two and a half months over there doing that. And I, the, one of the lessons is you have to get out of your comfort zone in order to grow. And if you don't get out of your comfort zone, you will never grow. So what did I do at the time? Um, the, the internet, this was nine, this was 2000. The internet was there, but it wasn't like it is today. I had to, um, I made friends with a pro. 
Um, I was a massage therapist contracted with the Jelly Belly team um, to work with them for a couple of the pro races in Northern California. And I said, I'll work with you. You just pay for my entry fee. So I, I did the category two race and I worked with these guys. And I did the category three, did I do the category three race? I did the category three race and then, um, and then worked with them. And one of the guys uh, was friendly enough and I asked like, hey, I wanna go to Europe. I wanna get better. And he said, call this guy Staff Boone, but you can't talk to staff. You have to talk to his son, Eve, and you gotta call him late at night. And here's the phone number. And I had to just, there was not an internet email. It was, I had to pick up the phone and call this guy um, and talk to him. He's like, well, how old are you? I'm like, I'm 26. He's like, well, you're a little too old. I'm like, no, I'm not. And he's like, why do you want to come here? He's like, cause I want to be a pro. I want to race bikes in Europe. I mean, they stood to make money from me, you know, because I paid rent for them and they took us to races, but I got completely out of my comfort zone to go do something brand new. I had no idea what it was going to be like. I got on, I got a, did I get a one-way ticket? I think I probably got a, I think I got a student ticket or some kind of like young uh, traveler's ticket for, you know, I don't know, $800. Maybe it was $1,500. I have no idea. Um, I, I took off from San Francisco and I flew into like uh, New York City and then we flew to, um, I got flew to like London and then I landed in Ghent. <laughs> something like that or maybe it was to Paris and then Ghent I don't know but I did just call them from a payphone when I landed and I didn't have I didn't have Belgian francs <laughs> I'd, I had a card I had to figure out how to do that and I call them but because I was traveling with a bicycle in a bag and it ha actually had the Motorola team uh, logo on it because I got it secondhand I got so much respect and help from everyone there um, but I still didn't speak the language and I'd call and be like, Hey, I'm, I'm finally here. And they rolled up in the Peugeot, put my stuff in the trunk, took me in like, here's where you're staying. You know, like, I don't think I had paid them ahead of time. Like I'd sent a check overseas ahead of time for the rent. It was crazy. Okay. But it was something I really wanted. Let me ask you this. Are you doing something like that right now? Have you done something like that before in your life? Are there any experiences that you've had so far in your life that you can pull from to help you in your business? Because I know this, that success in business doesn't come overnight. It doesn't come just because you buy a course. It doesn't come just because you get a coach. It comes because you do the work. It comes because you put in the work and you put in the time and the effort, the time under tension to get shit done. It comes because you trust yourself that you know that you're gonna be okay at the end of the journey and you're not gonna let yourself down no matter what, right? But if you don't have that trust, you don't have that ability to go with your gut and just see what happens, like you're never gonna reach the level of success that you actually want. You should, if you don't have the ability to get uncomfortable, just go and get a job doing home health. Make some money, pay off your loans and then find uh, some job that you love, right? You have to be persistent and you've got to be around people that are better than you. So what I do, I went there and I'm riding with these guys that are in the top class in like uh, uh, Great Britain, um, New Zealand, Australia. These guys are like in pro races at home. Like we weren't pros, we weren't contracted, but over in Europe, you're either contracted or not contracted. And we were in the non-contracted um, races these guys were so much better than me. Like the way that they rode, the way that they talked, I mean, not just the way that I couldn't understand a lot of their English, but the way that they talked about racing, their mindset around what they ate, how they took care of themselves, it just all rubbed off. Like I was where I needed to be, right? Remember, I was there as a category three, like I was probably there a year too early, but I was there at the year at the right time. And I came back from that trip and I went to a three week race in uh, the United States for category threes and I was one of the top 10 guys that dominated. Did I win every race? No, but I was definitely one of the strongest. And my racing style is a little different. I don't sprint at the end and when you're in category three, there's a lot of races end in sprints. Guys are strong enough to chase you down, but they won't attack you. Um, did I win some races? Yeah, I totally did. I came back, I was flying. I upgraded category two, but guess what? I started racing as a category two that next year and I was like, holy shit, like 
what am I in? So when you're category two in the United States, it's most eight, 90% of the races are pro ones and twos and you're racing with the pros. And I knew I needed a coach. I knew I could get better if I had a coach. I just couldn't find the right one. And I eventually did. And guess what? It took me, how many years did it take me to go from three to two? It took me like six or seven years. Once I became a category two and I got a coach, it took me um, a little over a year to become a category one. Okay, I got a coach and it's, what do we do? He put me on a training regimen so I knew exactly how to train every day and I took Mondays and Fridays off the bike to rest. I had a winter workout, like a workout program over the winter um, to develop uh, strength and stability in places that I needed it. If I look back now as a physical therapist, knowing what I know, I would do things differently in the winter. But at the time, like this was the this was it. That my coach, guess what? My coach was a pro. I had a Ashley Powell. He was a pro. He was a self-funded pro back when you could be a pro on a team of one. Like this is the guy. He was an independent pro. Like he had beat me in races when I was uh, a few years before when I was younger. And Ashley was up there. He won some really big races in the U.S. And I was like dude, I need a, I need a coach. And we talked every week. Uh, he gave me a plan. Um, did I need to talk to him every week? No, but we did a, but I did. He gave me a plan. We talked strategy mostly. How are you feeling? Okay. Here's what we're going to do this week. Here's where we're going to adjust your plan this week. And, uh, within, within a year and a half, it was like 18 months or so. I was able to upgrade to category one. Did I upgrade to category one by winning every race? No, I didn't. This is one of my things that success isn't winning. One of the things that success is consistency. You don't have to win everything. Everything You don't have to get everything perfect. You just have to be consistent and do it. So I was able to get up there and move up. So to go from three to two, you have to get like, I don't know, 20 points. And points start, you know, like first place through seventh. And it's like, I don't know, it's seven, five, four, three, two, one, something like that. Maybe it's five point five places. For bigger events, it goes down to 10. When you're in category two, now I'm competing with pros and I could get 30 points to move from two to one. The difference between one and pro is someone actually signs a contract with you and pays you some dollars. There's not really a minimum. I think the minimum is like 500 bucks or something like that, or at least it was at the time. I was still, you know, as a bike messenger, making more than my friends, making more than my coach when I was a bike messenger riding bikes and he did racing. Um, but I wanted to race, not work as a bike messenger. Success isn't winning, it's consistency. Consistency, getting out there every day, riding and training, no matter whether it's raining, or it's cold. I mean, 80% 80, 80 of the days that I trained in San Francisco, it was anywhere between 45 and 55 degrees, and it was wet. Probably 80 days, 80% 80 of the days that I trained. It was wet at some point in the ride, whether it was wet in my neighborhood in the Mission, or over in uh, the marina on the way to the bridge, um, and then it would be sunny in Marin, or it was sunny in San Francisco, and I'd get 100 miles up into Marin, and it started raining on you on the way home. It's consistency in getting out there and doing things that you don't want to do, because you have a goal. Are you doing things that you don't want to do right now, or are you avoiding the discomfort? Do you have a goal in mind? Maybe your goal is not strong enough. Maybe if you're not willing to do um, the hard shit, maybe you just don't have a good goal. Maybe you don't have a clear goal, an idea, a vision of what you want for yourself, your business, your life, and your career. So I had a very clear vision, and it's something that got me to, I wouldn't, at this time I wasn't waking up early. I would wake up at nine, I'd go ride from 10 to two, I'd come home and eat lunch, um, take a shower, go do massage from 4 to 9 p.m., come home and eat dinner, and then in the winter, I'd go work out at 10 p.m., right? Consistency, doing the things that you don't wanna do, getting uncomfortable. Like, I don't go ride when it's 45 degrees and raining right now, but I did, I did when I was training, I wanted to be a pro, okay? That's what I want you to understand is that you've got to pull from these places. Like, but why did I do that? Guess, you know why? When I was in Belgium, Staff Boone's son, Eve, told me I was too young. I was too old. He said, you're too old. You're 26. What are you doing over here? He said, why are you here? Well, guess what? Eve didn't make it as a pro either, and he was a sore, bitter, uh, 
scarcity mindsetted man at that time. I mean, I didn't know how to call him that at the time. I was like, don't tell me that I'm too old. 20, I was 26 or 27. Well, guess what? After I was a category one, I was the best person on my team. I spent a year helping my teammates upgrade from category two to category one. I, I sacrificed my own results for my teammates results. That didn't do me any favors. You know why? Because the next year when, uh, when our team moved from an amateur team to a pro team, we had, so we had sponsors. I had spent like a lot of my time working as a temp and doing whatever, um, building our team and getting sponsorships. Like I, I got $20,000 worth of sponsorships for our team to race bikes, free bikes, free, um, discounted equipment, uh, free uniforms and clothing. I had to have like, I had to have five sets of everything cause I couldn't do my laundry every day, at least five. I passed it off to these other guys. Um, when I, you know, when I upgraded to category one, cause I was like, I just don't have time. I need to train, I need to work, I need to rest and eat, sleep. And they did it, but guess what? They took our sponsor that I landed and got the sponsor to give us more money and help us turn into a pro team. But guess what? I didn't get onto the pro team. And they didn't tell me. They didn't tell me in October or November that Aaron, we're not bringing you on the pro team, like you should go find another team. They just kind of led me on. I went to a training camp with them. I did everything. And by the time January comes around, they're like, Aaron, you're not on the pro team. And I'm like, what? Like I've been to training camps and everything with you guys. And they're like, well, and even the, the owner of the main sponsor was like, Aaron, when you upgrade to category one, we'll get you on the pro team. I'm like, you don't know. I've been in category one for a while. I'd sacrificed my results for my teammates to help them upgrade. And these guys are my friends and they're doing what's best for them. Right. But they weren't like, why isn't, I don't know. They weren't like, why isn't Aaron on the pro team? We're not moving onto the pro team unless Aaron comes. Maybe they assumed I was going to be on there. Uh, the team brought in three other guys who were older than me. Um, but they had been pros before. And the thing is, is when you're a division three pro team, 60 or 70% of your riders have to be under the age of 26 because it's a developmental pro team. And so in order to get a pro team at that level, you have to have a, most of the guys under the age of 26. I was 28, <laughs> right? They brought in three guys who had already been on pro teams. That are stab One guy was established like US national criterium champion. Two other guys were great, but guess what happened? Um, by March that year, um, one of the guys uh, had tested positive for like steroids. He had tested positive the year before, but he, they found out and so he got suspended and left the team in March. In the summer, the guy who had been a national champion was such an asshole, he left the team. And then there was the, the one guy um, left. And at none of those times did they say, hey, Aaron, now we have room for you on the team. But guess what I did? The year before, I was nice. I wanted my teammates to upgrade. And I'm trying to be a team player, but I sacrificed a lot of my own results for them. And in business, we're at war, right? You're like, I can be friends with, you know, the owner of the business down the street, but guess what? I still have a family to feed. I have people I, that depend on me for their income. Like, I can't just be nice in business. I can't just sit around and, let people come into my group, the Cash PT Nation, who are also coaches and poach my clients. I've spent way too much time building that thing. Like you don't come in there and start poaching clients and you, you don't come post up uh, in front of my business, uh, LeBauer Physical Therapy and try to post our clients, like poach our clients. You would never do that. So, and I'm not gonna let you, but there was a time in business where I was a little bit like, well, I don't wanna be mean to people. I don't wanna be, um, I don't want to be rude, but what I've realized is that people don't know what they're doing. And so you, at a certain point, you do have to look out for yourself, right? You have to, you can be nice and abundant. And at the same time, you have to look out for yourself. When I was racing bikes that last years, like I wanted to have fun and look out for my teammates, but guess what? I sacrificed too many of my results. I didn't have the results that, uh, the team would look at and be like, Hey, Aaron, like, dang, you just won some of those races. You just did really great. Like, no, I was trying to lead my teammates out to help them so they could get points and upgrade. And we could, you know, all be in the same uh, national level events because as a category one, there's events that I was going to, my teammates couldn't go to. Okay. So I, I think let's, let's look at this and think about like, yes, I've got the stories and everything, but I want you to understand like business is war. You got to go to war with your business. 
not with your business, with the other people. Like there's competition and there's plenty of people, there's, pl well, there, there's plenty of people out there who need our help. This is also not like a hobby. Your business is your job, your livelihood. You got to go in and, and look out for yourself and your team before we talk about like our competition. That's one of the great reasons why coming to PT BizCon every year in the spring is awesome because how many of you are hanging out with other cash PT practice owners in your town? There may not be any, but if there are, like are you hanging out with other clinic owners in your town? No, because they view you as competition. I'm not hanging out with the owners of pretty much every uh, PT clinic here in Greensboro. There's one person that I hang out with John Davidson, he owns uh, GSO Fit and he has a physical therapy practice and we're good friends. But until John moved to town, like, and he even told me, he's like, Aaron, I was scared to, you know, come talk to you and introduce yourself because you would view me as competition. It just, it doesn't happen. But that's why going to someone like PT BizCon, it was great because, or being in our Platinum Mastermind, we can hang out and work with other people who are doing what we're doing and not feel that kind of like competition or regret for sharing information, right? And you just got to know that um, in your personal relationships, you can absolutely be nice. But in your business relationships, you need to be a little bit cutthroat. And I learned this the hard way from multiple places. And I learned it from racing bikes. Right? Okay. There's a couple other things here that um, let's talk about. Like I've talked about age. Age is a number. 26 is not too old. 48, I just turned 48 yesterday. 48 is not too old, right? New. I, I want you to know if you're a new grad or a student and you're listening to this, you can absolutely start a business right out of school. I've helped, I don't know, hundreds of new grads launch cash practices right out of school. I've verified over um, 35 of them. And then, you know, I know there's thousands of people that listen or have been inspired or whatever. I mean, you know, I can tell you, um, Ben Baggy is one of the ones I've worked with uh, the closest, but also Derek Nielsen, Tyler Shelton. Um, you know, these guys are all making six and seven figures a year. And they pretty much started uh, out of PT school. Success comes at any age. Because there's also people that work for 20 years for someone else and finally were like, I got to start my own business. And then they go and start their own business. And then they, you know, go and make six and seven figures. You can do it at any age. You don't let your age define you. Don't let your age say, oh, well, we didn't learn. I didn't learn TikTok growing up, so I'm not going to use TikTok. If you learned uh, neuroanatomy, you can go learn any social media. You just got to have the willingness to do it. Like my dad, he's 85. He's probably still doesn't know how to turn on the VCR, even though we don't have it anymore. Um, he just doesn't know. But he could. But you know what he used to do? He used to put catheters in people's hearts. Talk about like, uh, like you got to be careful. You got to know what you're doing. He used to do cardiac catheterizations, but yet he couldn't run the VCR. He didn't want to run the VCR. If he wants to do something, he'll learn it. If it's interesting to him, he'll learn everything about it. Okay. The age isn't the thing that's going to define us or define you. How long you've been in this field, whether you've been doing it for 10 years or you just got started. It's not going to define your success in business. What defines your success in business is your willingness to make it work, the consistency, who you put yourself around, how persistent you are, and whether you want to get out of your comfort zone. Because you probably have a really comfortable job you could go back to. It just might suck. Another one of the things I want to share with you is that time off is just as important as time under tension. So I learned this racing bikes. I had to. I took more time off when I started working with a coach, but I, I worked harder in the time when it was under tension. Uh, when my training days were harder, more focused, my time off um, the bike, my time off during the week was more focused. Now as a business owner, like entrepreneurship, um, it's not take time off from the business, it's a work-life mix, but you gotta understand like, you gotta get out and take some time off and vacation. Like I love what I do and even yesterday on my birthday, I went to work. And guess what, Greg Todd sent me a message. He's, He's like, happy birthday, um, go work hard because you know that's what we love to do. And it is, it is what I love to do. Um, but I also, in pre-pandemic in 2019, I spent 81 days out of town with my family. How can I do that? It's because I've set up my business in a way that allows me to do that. Okay, so you need to be able to 
set up your business that allows you to do that. If you just have a job because it's just you and you're a cash practice owner, even if you're making six figures, you just have a job. If you go out of town and you don't make any money when you're out of town, if, if you have an online course or you have team members providing services in your clinic that generates money uh, while you're not working, when you've, if you separate yourself um, from trading time for money, then you have a business and you can take the time off to get to the next level. Okay, you must be willing to invest and go into debt. Like, who says you have to pay off all your student loans as fast as possible? Whoever's saying that, you need to stop listening to them if you want to have a successful business. If you want to make hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars as a physical therapist, you need to stop focusing on your debt and start focusing on leveraging investments. And the difference is, we've talked about this plenty, debt is, let me buy a BMW and pay 400 dollars a month or whatever it costs now uh to lease it or to get a loan um for something that you know like isn't going to add value to your uh bank account it's going to take from your bank account it's going to go down in value but you must be willing to invest in the travel the coaching the entry fees like what are the entry fees in racing for business the entry fees are like paying for click funnels and sam cart and pt email engine and you know, proof and this and that and this and that. Like you have to be willing to invest in yourself in business to go into the course. So are you going to go to dry needling one weekend and pay 1500 bucks, but then go, Hey, you know what? I would never paid 1500 bucks to learn the step-by-step -step strategy to um, make six figures in a cash practice. The problem is you don't want to make six figures in a cash practice. You don't w actually want to be in business. You like the idea or you don't think that you'd be successful and you're scared, right? Because that you just spent that $1,500 on the iPhone 13 Pro or the dry needling course, but you're not gonna go spend it on growing your business because you can do it yourself. You could learn dry needling yourself. You absolutely can. I had a classmate in school, she didn't come to class. She got A's on every test. She just read the book. She got A's and she got reprimanded for not being in class. She's like, I don't need to be in class to pass. Like, oh, I need to be in class to pass because I don't learn reading. I learn doing and asking questions. <clears throat> but you must be willing to invest and go into debt. I went into like $45,000, $50,000 worth of debt racing bikes. Guess what? I paid it off before I became a PT because it was worth it to me. And my biggest sponsors were Visa and MasterCard. I put a lot of those travel expenses on credit cards. Okay. Um, I think the last one is you need to take care of your body and because new, taking care of your body and nutrition is key to your performance as a business owner. You may or may not have seen the post I put up yesterday um, on Instagram. It's about me training with kettlebells. So like right now I'm training to be a strong first kettlebell certified instructor. It's been a goal of mine for about a year and a half, but I know, look, I'm six foot three. I think like I've been swinging kettlebells for six years but you have to be really strong and kettlebells are there's a lot of strength and there's a lot of skill and there's a lot of technique so strength is one thing but the skill and technique is another so i'm taking care of my body my shoulders my neck feel better than they did when i was racing bikes because i'm working with a coach I'm working with my physical therapist and i'm working on and my nutrition my nutrition has been on point for about 10 years it slid a lot during covid because i just stay up at night and eat some popcorn or cookies because, you know, needed a little break from reality. And my uh, thing suffered for that. I could tell. If you focus on your, on a goal. So I said back to the goal, um, ADD moment there. If you focus back to the goal, strong first kettlebell instructor by the time I'm 50. Because after you, after 50, when you're 51, you can do it with a 20 kilogram weight. And I know that's, I know that's possible for me. The 24 kilogram weight that used to be an impossible goal. Right now, it's not an impossible goal. I can see it. I just know it's coming down the road. Because you got to swing that thing overhead 100 times in five minutes. And so um, I'm working with a coach. I'm working with the kettlebell coach, Brett Jones. He's awesome. He's like the strong first like lead trainer. Um, he's great, right? I know I want to get a goal. I want to get there faster. I'm going to go basically, I'm not going to buy, I can't buy my way to the top. I can buy the knowledge. 
and the training and the skills and work on it. And he knows I can get there before I'm 50. I'm just like, I just want to get there before I age out of this weight, right? That's my, that's my main goal. I'll probably get there in the next year. But why am I doing that? Because I know that when I can do that, my body is at peak fitness. It's, I am stronger. I move better than I did when I was racing bicycles. Because when I was racing bicycles, I wasn't training my whole body. I wasn't training my core. I wasn't doing yoga. And I wasn't doing kettlebells. I wasn't doing CrossFit. I was doing like more traditional weightlifting, um, leg presses, uh, quad extensions, hamstring curls, um, calf raises. That was my winter strength training program. And I would warm up with like a bar doing squats, but God forbid I would ever go below parallel because that was dangerous for your knees, right? But that was also 20 years ago. I also, 20 years ago when I was racing, we were sponsored by Cliff Bar and I had Cliff Bars coming out my ears and I would end every ride hungry. Even though I'd have one Cliff Bar an hour is 220 calories an hour. So maybe I wasn't getting enough calories in per hour, but those things were sweet. But when I trained um, about six or seven years ago to go climb um, Mount, uh, what's it called? Uh, the, uh, the tallest peak the east of the Mississippi. I always forget the name of this. Um, oh, there it is. Yeah, it's, uh, it's Mount Mitchell. Mount Mitchell, right? So Greenville, the top of Mount Mitchell was like 107 miles, like last 45 miles are all climbing. It was the longest I ever spent on a bike. I spent seven, it took me seven or 15 minutes to do this ride. I spent a lot of it by myself, but guess what? I was not hungry when I finished because I learned in training a few years ago that when we were doing a whole 30, I was like, how's I gonna, how am I going to ride bikes and do a whole 30 when I can't eat cliff bars and all these bars? I had to make my own rice cakes and my own oatmeal bars. And when I started eating nutrition on the bike, I would finish and I wouldn't be hungry. I'd actually be full and completely satisfied and I'd have extra food. I was like, wow, I don't need to take all this. No, because I was eating real whole foods. And so in riding bikes and racing bikes, I learned looking back, like my nutrition, had I known now, had I known then what I know now, like would have been even better. Would it have gotten me to the pro level? No, because I was still too old, remember? But I know that it would have helped me be at my peak even more. But I just didn't, I didn't have that information then. We all didn't really, because that was 2000, right? Um, but t- right now, I know that. And so I'm not going to, you know, diverge from that. Because if my body is in peak performance, guess what? I can show up at work feeling good, strong. I don't like, I don't have to worry about my body hurting at work or my nutrition or my health suffering keeping me from growing my business and going to that war we were talking about with our competition. Our war to help more people avoid expensive imaging and unnecessary surgery. I know that it's not my body that's going to keep me from doing that. It's my willingness to do it or my ability to say, hey, I want to go to work today because I love work. I want to stay home and work on my scooters or I have something else I want to do. Like my choices keep me from going to work, not my body. Yes, there's some things out of my control, like getting a getting a cold, flu, COVID, or something like that. I haven't had COVID yet, thank God. But you know, these, some of these things aren't aren't in our control completely. Getting sick, but what is in our control is the things I put in my my mouth, the um, exercise regimen that I've committed to. Like I'm working with Brett, I pay him enough money a month to make me commit, but it's not enough money that is going to hurt my bank account, but I'm going to show up not because of the money, but because of my commitment, right? I'm going to commit having working with someone else helps me stay committed, but I'm going to show up every day. Part of my routine, uh, during the last, uh, year and a half, 20 years is, uh, to get up at five 30 and work out. Now it's cold and I go home at 11 when I get done with, or 12, and I get done with this recording, I'm gonna go home and go work out because I'm committed to that. Taking care of your body and nutrition is key to performance in your business, but guess what? If you're a physical therapist or a healthcare provider, you gotta walk the walk if you're talking the talk. You can't just be like, you know, hey, uh, CrossFitters, like you should come to my practice I'm great at CrossFit and you've never been to CrossFit or you don't look like you actually train doing something or you don't feel like you do something. You, like, I don't wanna say like the physical look, let me go backwards and say, what you look like isn't really matter. It's, uh, so don't take that out of context, is that you don't create a, um, 
a feeling of confidence that you train and work out because you know what it's like because you're taking care of your body. You have to be a leader and example um, of the actions you take every day if you want your patients to do the same. You know what the trouble is? I think a lot of us get stuck like overworking, not enough time. We don't make enough money, got to earn more. Um, I don't have time, you know, I'm going to put my exercise and fitness on the back seat. It just becomes a downward spiral. And you know what? Like, I get it. But you got to make time for these things, especially as a business owner. And you may have to sacrifice them for a while, but you can't let them go completely. There may be times where you're like, I cannot absolutely do that. Like when COVID came through and I had to move PT BizCon from an in-person to a virtual event. And then when it was done, I had to make sure both my businesses and the clinic uh, stayed uh, alive. Like my fitness took a deep dive, but I got back on it. And it's been the thing that's helped me tremendously over the last 20 months, stay focused, because it's a great outlet. But you can't let your fitness and nutrition go and you have to be, um, an example to your patients and clients. I think one of the lessons I've learned, and I didn't learn this from racing bikes, but I learned this from working with uh, Jake, who's the marketing Facebook sales guy that works with me that you may know. Um, Jake said people buy like they sell, or actually they sell like they buy. It's just like, how are you gonna go sell a healthy, fit lifestyle if you're not working on it yourself? How are you gonna go sell physical therapy for $200 a visit if you wouldn't pay for it yourself? You know, I was a guest on a podcast yesterday with another um, person who's a nurse practitioner. Um, and he was talking about his primary care physician. He goes to a direct primary care practice physician. And actually, he works in a, a DPC practice. And guess what? My physician is a DPC physician. It actually costs me less to see him than my copay would be to see him. So you have to like live up to what you have to live up to your own expectations that you want for your patients and your clients. I hope that's making sense. I don't talk about this very much. And so the words may not come out uh, exactly right, but if you get what I'm saying, um, I think you'll understand. Um, you know, our fitness and nutrition is key to our performance in life and in our business, in our health and our relationships. And if you don't have the right balance, it's not gonna be even. But if you don't have the right mix or balance, it's going to be detrimental to your success as a business owner. So hopefully you, you can see a little bit about, you know, how did I learn to become the business owner I am? I did not have, uh, did not grow up with parents who were entrepreneurs. I had to go out and find mentors and coaches and courses and mastermind programs to learn how to do this. But I've been asked recently, Aaron, where'd this come from? How'd you learn it? Well, I spent... 12 or 15 years racing bicycles. I learned a ton out of that time racing bikes. And yeah, you know, there's a lot of other life experiences I have. You may not even want to know about them. It doesn't really matter. But what I want you to know is that your life experiences are going to shape you and you need to tap into what they are and what they told you and what they taught you in, if you want to be successful. But if you haven't had them and you can take anything from the life experiences I've had and adapt them, it's going to help you become even more successful. You don't have to have gone through the same experiences I have for me to download that information and those lessons to you. If you just sit there and go trust, hey, Aaron had this, Aaron did this, you know, Aaron, other people, not just Aaron, other people have had this experience. Other people have done this. Like, why am I going to wait to try to figure this out on my own? Let me just go do that now. And guess what? It's probably going to work. But if it doesn't work, that doesn't mean it wasn't the right idea or the right strategy. It just means it wasn't the right time, uh, the right idea for that time or the right strategy for you. And that's okay. It's just like saying physical therapy doesn't work. Just because you have one bad experience of physical therapy doesn't mean you failed physical therapy. It means you need to see another physical therapist. Wouldn't you agree? So one last thing, let's do something fun. Um, if you love the podcast, or guess what? If anything on the podcast has ever helped you in your business or grow your PT business, I would greatly appreciate you leave a five-star rating and review. And uh, as an ethical bribe, um, because uh, you know I wanna give away some cool stuff, one person who leaves a review between 
let's say now in the next episode, in the next solo episode that I do, is gonna win one of our 80% is good enough sweatshirts. I don't know if you've seen them, I'm actually not wearing one right now, but it's a really dope uh, blue sweatshirt and it says 80% is good enough on the back. Because remember, 100% uh, business is gonna kill your business. 80% is good enough. You do not need to get an A to make a million dollars or, or 10 million or a billion. You just need to put in a lot of the effort and a lot of the lessons that um, you've learned today. Be consistent and you'll get there. So if you leave a five-star rating review um, over on iTunes, um, we're gonna pick, I'll pick one person uh, next time. Uh, I'll read out the reviews. You probably need to leave your name and I'll read them out and you're gonna have to contact me and say, hey, that was me and send me a screenshot of some sort to prove it. Uh, and I'll send you a uh, sweatshirt. I'll probably send you um, some other swag and uh, a book and some stuff like that too. Um, so appreciate it. And if it doesn't feel like that's you, don't go do it. Just whatever. Um, but if you've got anything out of this, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, because you know what? Uh, I just love to get some feedback because I learn or I get feedback by verbal and, uh, and auditory cues. I just love to know like, is this helping you in any way? And if it is, um, a review uh, helps me know that. It helps me know what to talk more about so that you can learn more uh, on your journey to business success. So again, this is Aaron LeBauer. This is the Cash PT Lunch Hour podcast. Um, that's not everything I learned from racing bikes, but that's a whole hell of a lot of it. And we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks. Thanks.